On January 7th, 1855, a young pastor stood to preach to his congregation in Southwark, England. And he began by saying, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of God. It is a subject so vast that all our pride is drowned in its infinity and all our thoughts are lost in its immensity. So preached Charles Spurgeon in London 150 years ago when he was remarkably barely 20 years old. If you read his writings, one of the constant challenges that would come from him to his generation was related to the nearly universal lack of a desire to know and study God. Five years after Spurgeon died, another boy was born. This young man would become a preacher as well, this time in America. His name was Iden Wilson Tozer. Now you know why he went after A.W. Uh, A.W. Tozer became known for his persistent warnings directed at the church for her doctrinal weakness and her, her shallowness. He wrote his classic work, and write this down, this will be the first of a couple of books I'll mention tonight you need to get if you don't have it already. The Knowledge of the Holy, just a little hardback book, I think it's about 80 pages. He writes this opening statement. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It is the most important thing. To answer the question, what is God like? The answer to that question will predict the spiritual future of that person. And it will predict the future of the church based on their answer. Who is God? And what is he like? Listen, who we think God is determines how we walk with him, why we obey him, how we talk to him, what we expect of him. It governs everything. All of this in volumes more really is bound up in this question, who is God? And so well, what I want to do tonight, I thought we'd get into the text, and we're not going to get there. All I want to do is just sort of prime the pump and, and ask and answer three questions. And as I studied and prayed about this, this is really as far as I got, and I knew we'd be out of time by the time we got through with this. So let me ask and answer three questions. Number one, what exactly is the study of God? Now, the 10 cent term for that is theology. You'd know that if you spent $250 an hour going through seminary like you know, some of us had to pay to find that out. You're finding it out tonight for free. The Greek term, thea, God, and logia, it, for reasoning or arguing or explaining. You put that together and you have then theology is the logical, reasonable discussion of God, who God is. What's he like? What are his attributes, his person, his his nature. In a rather unusual positive statement by Tozer, and there aren't many by the way, he was rather caustic and, and prickly, but uh, he was used by God to challenge the church. Uh, he wrote in his work, The Pursuit of God, these words, and that's the second book by the way, The Pursuit of God, a little longer, these words, in, in this hour of all but universal darkness, he wrote this 60 years ago, one cheering gleam appears. Within the fold of conservative Christianity, there is an increasing number of people whose lives are marked by a growing hunger after God himself. They are eager for spiritual realities. They are thirsty for God, and they will not be satisfied until they have drunk deep at the fountain of living water. 
And I, I read that because this study is really for those who are thirsty for God, which I believe you are and I am. Question number two. What can I study to know God better? Well, one resource is creation, uh, the natural world, which is why the, the, the psalmist is constantly inviting us to look around, to look up at the stars and the, the sun, moon, planets, the beauty of the world and the stars in the sky. He writes in Psalm 8, 1, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth who has displayed you have displayed, you have exposed your splendor to the world above the heavens. In Psalm 19, he writes this, the heavens are telling the glory of God. They're, they're describing his glory, the work of his hands, declaring that day to day pours speech, day after day pours forth speech, and night after night reveals knowledge. I love the paraphrase of the message by Eugene Peterson on that phrase, he says it this way, Madam Day holds classes every morning and Professor Knight lectures each evening. The older I get, the more I marvel and enjoy the creative handiwork of God. I, I don't know if I was just moving too fast in my 30s or 40s, but I'm, I'm slowing down, except on Penny Road. But at any rate, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just enjoying it. The other, the other morning, it was yesterday morning, I'm standing, a little breakfast room, open shades, it's early, and I got a cup of coffee, and I'm looking out, and, and, and uh, my wife has uh, you know, filled all these bird feeders, and I'm standing there, and there's this, this, this brilliant display of creativity, and there are finches of a, uh, any number of colors, and some bluebirds, there's a cardinal, some morning doves, and I'm just standing there watching and looking at the splashes of color and the creative design on feathers and over eyes and all of the different reds and, and peaches and grays and blacks, all the different hues. And as I'm watching beyond them at that very moment, out in a pasture that belongs to somebody else to mow, fortunately, galloped three horses. I mean, you, it just doesn't get any better than that. And that was, that was all free. I had to buy the coffee beans and the bird seed, but you know what I mean. This was unbelievable, and I just stood there and worshipped the Lord in His creative genius. Look around. God has given us this natural world that points to Him. In fact, Romans 1 gives us the interesting truth that even if someone never hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, even without hearing the gospel... They are still guilty of rejecting God and without excuse, Paul says, because they had nature. And what did they do? They suppressed the truth that was obvious. And they said it must have just happened by chance. Rather than all of the order and the beauty and the creativity must come from someone who ordered it, someone who's creative. And if they hadn't worked so hard to suppress the truth of creativity and complexity and color, they would have been able, Paul says, to put together the fact that there is a creator with some amazing, powerful attributes. And that's without the scriptures. And speaking of, that's the other resource then for study. Beyond creation, by far the most significant is revelation. Creation opens the door to observation. Revelation opens the door to inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16. Inspiration. Theopneustos. The very breath of God. This is God's breath, so to speak. Well, what does God's word breathe about God? Who is God? And what is he like? Ultimately, that drives you then to the scriptures where God discloses the truth about himself that you would never observe in nature. And of course, with that, the redemptive truth of Christ. 
But keep in mind, beloved, that the, the scriptures aren't comprehensive. There is much more about God than we have revealed in these 66 books. So we effectively, at the outset of our study of God, immediately live with this tension. We, we pursue to know Him, and at the same time, we know that we'll never know everything about Him because everything about Him can't be revealed. Part of the thrill of eternity is to have an infinite amount of time to study the infinity of God as He teaches us. But right now, we, we have trouble, we have problems, obviously. You can't reduce down everything about God. Our finite minds can't grasp it. Anyway, infinity can't be reduced to a paragraph. Uh, it can't be reduced to a, a, a set of volumes. Even if they were as large as that 30 set of encyclopedias, the Encyclopedia Britannica, which I bought as a seminary student, and when my wife came home from work, I was studying, and she said, what have you done? And I said, well, it, it's only $39 a month for 300 years, but never mind that. <laughs> all of the knowledge. Look, honey, I mean, it's all here. I got it all. Even that it would only begin, it'd be a drop in the bucket to reveal the truth of God. You remember what John the Apostle said? He said in that classic text in John 21, he said, look, if you could fill up the entire world with books, you still wouldn't have enough space to describe what Jesus did and said in only three and a half years. You'd have to fill up the world with books to describe three and a half years. How in the world can you describe God then? The only thing we can do, and what I trust we will do, is get a little sip, a little taste. But I'm convinced that even the littlest sip of sovereignty and his glory and his grace, his nature, his attributes will boggle our minds. God hasn't told us everything about himself we'd like to know, but he has revealed everything we need to know so that we can enter into a relationship with him and walk with him and know how to talk to him and know what he expects of us and know how to serve him and worship him. And let me add this. Anybody who thinks they know who God is and their knowledge of God is different from that which is revealed in this book is tragically deceived. Tragically deceived. I have begun reading uh, a recently published uh, biography of the Wright brothers. I read one a few years ago, and, and I'm, I'm captivated by these very creative, uh, very brilliant young men. They invented things that allowed them to invent the airplane. And the biography contains, it's rather, rather lengthy, it contains letters they wrote, it contains pictures, it contains descriptions. Uh, personal interests and, and a detailed timeline of their creative invention. After finishing that book, and I'll be finished, you know, in a few uh, weeks or so. Um, this is what I do for fun. In case you're wondering, I'm not, I'm not, you know, skipping on my study. Uh, I'm doing my homework. Um, but at any, like I said this morning, I'm doing it. But if I if I finish that book, can you imagine me saying to someone, even with what little you know about them, you know what those guys? They were amazing, absolutely amazing violinists and, and they hated flying machines we'd well, wonder what biography I, I read if you do read their biography you'll discover they do not play the violin and they love talking about flying machines in fact when they were little boys watching the birds fly they, they marveled at them. They measured the distance at how quickly they flew from point A to point B. And they measured the weight and, and, and the distance and the speed and their kids figuring all this out. They couldn't play the violin. It doesn't matter what we might think God is like. The question is, what does his word say he's like? And this is the prayer of the Apostle Paul 
For the early believers in Colossae, he writes this in Colossians 1, 9 through 10. We have not ceased to pray for you and to, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you might be increasing in the knowledge of God. Hey, Paul, what are you praying about for this church here today? What would you pray? What he prayed in, for those believers in Colossae. I'm praying that you will increase in the knowledge of God. Who is God? What is he like? Do we really know? I read this past year the announcement of Chester Nez, who had passed away. It struck my attention. I tucked it away. Chester was the last living member of a team of Navajo tribesmen who came to be called the Navajo Code Talkers. Chester Nez was one of the original 29 Navajo recruited by the U.S. military to create an unbreakable code used only by the Allies that uh, the enemy forces could not figure out. Uh, Navajo uh, is a complex, unwritten language without an alphabet. That'd be hard to break, wouldn't it? Well, only a, a handful of non-Navajo people could even speak it. So these men were recruited to come up with a code that couldn't be broken by enemy intelligence. And from 1942 to 1945, these code talkers, they were called, participated in every single major operation the U.S. Marines conducted in the Pacific region. Philip Johnson, the son of a missionary to the Navajo, came up with the idea to use these men to communicate in a way no one else would understand. And the code was never broken. Listen, how in the world can an infinite creator with a language unlike ours and a nature so different communicate with a finite creature? Well, God has effectively revealed the code here. The Bible is God's own communication with mankind about who he is and what he's like. It, it isn't comprehensive, but it is definitive. It isn't exhaustive, but it is adequate to reveal enough of who he is and what he is like so that we can love him and walk with him and talk with him and even come to know him better. Here's another question, number three. What are the benefits of studying God? Well, I know we'd all say, well, we're not supposed to ask questions like that, it's just beneficial. Well, what are the benefits? Well, let me give you five of them. Let me give you five. First, wisdom. And I'll, I'll touch down into, into, into Proverbs chapter nine and verse 10. Uh, the fear of the Lord, Solomon writes, is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So Solomon is effectively telling us that God will show us how to live a wise life. So we're, we're told then that, that knowledge, uh, biblical knowledge, isn't so much related to an IQ. There are plenty of smart people who live foolish lives. There are people who got A's on their report cards, but they live life going from one failure to another. It's not that they don't have enough information. It isn't that they don't have enough education. It's just that they don't have wisdom. Wisdom enables someone to apply the knowledge they have in making the right decision in life. And you can't get that kind of wisdom apart from knowing God. So wisdom would be one. Closely associated with this idea is another benefit. We'll call it in a word direction. Direction. To put it another way, God allows you to maintain this, this sense of direction when you need it as you pursue not so much that direction, but you pursue Him. The Apostle Peter writes it this way in 2 Peter 1, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, seeing that in His divine power He's granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge 
of him who called us by his glory. J.I. Packer illustrated this idea by imagining how terrible and unfair it would be to helicopter into the Amazonian jungle, uh, uh, pick up a tribesman who's never been out of the jungle before, and, and, and fly him to London, England, and set him down in the middle of that city and then tell him, fend for yourself, try to do the best you can. Packer goes on to apply it. We are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is and who happens to run it. Disregard the study of God and you sentence yourself to stumble and blunder through life blindfolded, as it were, with no sense of direction and no understanding of what surrounds you. This is, he writes, the perfect way to waste your life. Have you ever met anybody and you've thought, that person has no direction? What's the solution? A map? No. A course? No. The knowledge and the pursuit of God. Another benefit is fruitful living. Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 9, and 10 that he was constantly praying for these believers that the church would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Those are coupled together, related together. One of the evidences of gaining an understanding of God is bearing fruit in good works. Now, Tony Evans, he has also written a book called God is Awesome. He's a pastor in the Dallas, Texas area, graduate of my alma mater, and, and I'm reading through that too. He's, he's very interesting to read. He has a wonderful sense of humor. But he, he made a, an interesting comment on this particular text. He wrote in his commentary on the attributes of God that, that fruit has at least two characteristics. Uh, one, fruit is never born for itself. It is always born for someone else to enjoy. He says, so, so that someone else can take a bite. When you start bearing fruit, he writes, other people want to take a bite out of your life. They want to be around you. They want to draw from you. Why? Because you're productive. And they can see that you have direction and wisdom. Secondly, fruit always reflects the character of the tree of which it is a part. So when you bear spiritual fruit, you are bearing witness to the character and the nature of the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, who is transforming your life. That comes from growing in the knowledge of God. There's another byproduct. Courage. Those three Hebrew men responded to Nebuchadnezzar's command. You remember in Daniel's biography? Refused to bow to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had created and he said everybody now bows when the music starts. And they said, no, we're not gonna. Daniel more than likely was out of town. He isn't even entering into the picture. Their lives are now literally at stake. They stopped the music, assumed they hadn't gotten the, you know, the message right, and the king was going to give them another chance and bow down or be thrown into the fiery furnace. Have you ever thought about the fact that they responded out of their knowledge of the attributes of God? Daniel 3, 16 says, finds them responding to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. Now wait a second. They had never seen God deliver anybody from the fiery furnace. They were about to be the first ones thrown in. They had never been threatened to die by means of fire. They had never personally experienced God delivering them from a fire. Here they are saying, God can do this. They applied what they knew about God's sovereign power to their particular situation. They knew that God was more powerful than this king and that fire. But they also understood something more about the attributes of God. 
because they went on to to say, and in their saying, understood evidently his divine prerogative and his divine right and his sovereign rule and his ability to decide what he wants to do without ever giving them an explanation. And so they add to that and they say, but if he doesn't, we're still going to follow him because he's a true and living God and he has a right to do whatever he wants to do and you're still following an idol. That came out of their understanding of the attributes of God courage in making the right decision. So you see, the question is not, do we really need to know God better? The question is, how can we afford not to grow in understanding Him better? One more. The list could, of course, go on much longer. But one more byproduct from the study of God is a sense of security. David writes in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake, he's describing the worst possible cosmic disturbances you can imagine. And then later in that Psalm, be still, and know that I am God. You ever thought about that wonderful invitation? Stop, stop, and come to know that I am God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's an invitation. Psalm 43, verse 8. God invites us to get to know Him. He's the one that says, taste. Stop. Study me. Now maybe, maybe you're convinced that you'd like to know God better, but you're not too sure He wants the same, and you're not really sure how He feels about it. I mean, who are we after all? Do you know anybody famous? Do you know anybody uh, wealthy, somebody, you know, up there at the top of the food chain and you think to yourself, you know, wow, I'd like to get to know that person better or at all. But you're intimidated. I mean, naturally, they're powerful, they're famous, and they're, they're not really in your orbit. Imagine walking up to, if you could get past the gate, and I wouldn't recommend you try without an invitation, but imagine you walk up to the White House and you knock on the door and they answer the door and you say to them, you know what, I, I'm here because I'd like to get to know the president. Well, the question isn't, do you want to get to know the president? The question is, does the president of the United States want to get to know you? And you'd better hope the answer is yes at that moment. The question is, does God want to get to know us? And does God want us to get to know Him? Well, here's the stunning truth of this study before us. It isn't just that you, you might want to get to know God better or become a better friend of God or more aware of His power or His presence, His attributes. God wants you and invites you to do just that. A.W. Tozer wrote this, it's just a staggering sentence or two in his work, The, the Pursuit of God. I, I, he says, I want deliberately to encourage this longing after God. And by the way, that is a work of God's grace in your heart. So if you leave, as you leave tonight, and you think about it before we begin again next Lord's Day, Lord willing, ask Him to give you a longing for Him. Ask Him to develop in you a longing to long for Him. Ask Him to give you a desire to desire Him. Tozer writes, the lack of this longing has brought us to a low estate. The stiff quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe. God, listen to this, God waits to be wanted. Wow. God waits to be wanted. 
What amazing grace. So he says, come and find in me refuge. Find in me strength. Not go over there and there's a pot of strength waiting for you. No, find it in me. Come to me. Come. Let's reason together. Let's sit down like close friends and talk about this. Even though your sins are stained scarlet, I can wash them as white as snow. Jesus is praying in John 7 to the Father and he's saying, Father, I, I long for them to know you like I do. What security there is in knowing that the one we want to get to know is waiting for us to want to know him. And he, by the way, knows us fully. So in this strange paradox, the one we are going to pursue together in our study already holds us in his hand. In that sermon preached in 1855, and with this I close, Spurgeon concluded with these words. It's a paragraph, so you're going to have to concentrate in following. It's late. We're almost done. He said this, In contemplating Christ, there is a balm for every wound. In musing on the Father, there is quiet for every grief. In the influence of the Holy Spirit, there is ointment for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go, plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity. And you shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed, invigorated, for I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devoted concentration on the subject of God. And so we begin.